Thank you for the opportunity to um, be here. So I want to say that uh, this is a return for me to San Antonio. I first set foot in San Antonio in 1971. Uh, I had received a draft notice that said I was drafted to be a private in the Army, but if I applied within two weeks, I could be a captain in the Medical Corps. And I kind of made that decision and found myself at Fort Sam Houston about two weeks after I finished my internship in internal medicine. This is where everybody went who was going um, overseas uh, at the time. So I spent six weeks here enjoying San Antonio in the summer and um, walking around in an army uniform um, and uh, coming onto the, uh, onto the base. We, uh, I learned a lot, actually. It was uh, interesting. And uh, we spent a week out at uh, Camp Bullis, uh, walking around with uh, heavy field packs. And they taught docs how to shoot rifles and do other things. So uh, that's my first memories of um, San Antonio. This is me in my uniform. Uh, I actually, I won't, just to shorten the story, I was drafted, had done a straight medical internship, and was sent to Panama to the Canal Zone Company to do anesthesia out of uniform. So for 1971, it was not a bad um, assignment. You know, I, I mean, I think public health is a lot of things. And I think that's what we heard. And, and it should be, because there's so many things that drive our Health, which gives the School of Public Health and its colleagues here on, on the campuses uh, a big mission. So I, I talk about this a lot. So when I, I've been in sort of medicine and public health, as you heard, for, for a long time. And Hopkins struggled to say what public health is. And its tagline became protecting health, saving lives, millions at a time. And if we've done our job correctly in public health, no one knows really we're doing it. Nobody ever walks up to me and says, thank you for giving back to me another half year of good life expectancy, right? That's, that's never happened. And so if you think about it, we're, we're there doing our thing, maybe until COVID comes along or something else reminds everyone of the importance of what, what we do. Here's the WHO definition of health. And I think probably most of you have seen this. And I think it's encompassing nature is what's important. It's, complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So the, those of you who are in public health, to keep this in your mind, because I think it's useful. It's an ideal. It's an aspiration, isn't it? Um, I don't know. How many of you today, maybe, is everybody a complete physical, mental, and are you all in a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being today? Maybe not everybody. If you are, raise your hand. No, I don't, don't, don't raise your hand. But I, I think um, this is an aspiration of what we want to, um, to achieve. And you know, in our sort of biopsychosocial models of disease, so many things drive where we are, OK, and what we are, uh, and what we are achieving. So I think. Um, that is why we have such a broad definition of public health, because there are so many things that determine our health and well-being. So medical care certainly figures in, access to medical care, the quality of the medical care. But there are so many other drivers. I mean, right now, you know, how many of us are worried about Ukraine and its implications for the world? Anybody worried about nuclear war? You know, something I grew up with, and now suddenly, tragically, new generations are having to worry about the possibility of you know, nuclear, use of nuclear weapons, unimaginable. Um, you know, when I was in elementary school, I had a couple of years in California, and we had nuclear drills. And what did you do when there's a nuclear drill? Get up and cover. You got under your desk. <laughs> and if you're in California, what did you do if there was an earthquake? got under your desk. I mean, these desks were really incredible. You know, they protected you against earthquakes and nuclear war. Um, so lots of things drive our health. And again, I think in thinking about shaping a curriculum in public health or in any health discipline, I think there has to be awareness of this broad range of 
factors as they affect uh, health. Um, you know, I've made this distinction between public health and what we do clinically. Uh, and I tell this story. So this is a book written by a New Mexico author. I spent 16 years at the University of New Mexico in my pulmonary physician days. And the person there with prematurely gray hair was me a while ago. And, uh, and you can see this interaction with uh, this poor woman who's dying of lung cancer. And there's really nothing to be done. And I'm unfortunately having, having a conversation with her that I had too many times with my patients with lung cancer because we didn't used to be able to do very much for them if, if they were inoperable. And the contrast, which is on the next slide, which disappeared, was with what we do in public health. And this protecting health, saving lives, millions um, at, a, uh, at a time. And a cartoon from the New Yorker that was there at the time of the uh, anthrax episodes uh, following 9-11. And it was so typically brilliant of you to have invited an epidemiologist. Beyond public health, and you've probably struggled with this, telling people about epidemiology and what you do. It used to be like, oh, epidemiology. There was the, always the, something to do with the skin. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, whatever. And, you know, I, I went through, you know, not telling people things like epidemiology is a study of the distribution of disease and its determinants. Don't do that. And, um, you know, sort of disease detective. So here's the Hopkins protecting health, saving lives millions at a time. This intersection with healthcare is critical. And I, I, I know that there's a MD, MPH. There should be RN, MPH, and other uh, important options. We just started a program with our physical therapy program. Uh, so we have a doctor of physical therapy, MPH option, dentistry, because of this intersection. And, and in my mind, so much of primary care is prevention. Um, I mean, that's really what pediatrics, much of it is about prevention, primary care, family medicine, general internal medicine. And it's there everywhere. So that intersection is important. And I think for a new school of public health, how that school integrates itself with its health sciences colleagues, its social sciences colleagues, is going to be very, um, very important and something to think about. At the top for everybody is the social determinants of health. Four words, and then impossible challenges embodied in those words. How do we take them on? Um, some of these are woven, as we know, into the fabric of our society. I think better recognize now the role of structural racism, better recognize now the legacies of, you name it, reconstruction, redlining, they're all there, and they remain as determinants. And, and again, we will, in a school of public health, talk about them, how we look at the consequences. Then the question of how we change things is going to be sitting there squarely with all of us, and perhaps with the school of public health um, in, the, uh, in the lead. Oops. All right, so this one says, I'm going to tell you about the school of public health. I actually keep talking to our folks in media because every time we have something in Colorado, we produce a picture of mountains. And uh, this really has not much to do with the Colorado School of Public Health, except that it's great to have the mountains nearby because you can look at them and then you can go hike, um, hike in them. So there's a, a picture, and I have no idea where this is. Um, so we, we have three programs. So we are a collaborative school. So we have the medical campus, the CU Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora to the east of Denver, now the third largest city in Colorado and very, very diverse. We have what looks like a school of public health there with five departments, biostatistics and informatics, health systems management policy, community behavioral health, epi epidemiology, and environmental occupational health. Okay, so that's there. We have Colorado State, which is up in Fort Collins, and it's an interesting institution. It has a very good veterinary school, lots of good research on infectious pathogens and other things, 
that gives us an opportunity to do things there that I think are special. Uh, we have the county extension program at an ag school. So we have that connection. We've had a lot of conversations about how to use the extension for public health purposes. We need to go beyond our conversations to, to reality, and I think we haven't done that yet. I have some ideas in mind that maybe I'll come back to later. Then, University of Northern Colorado. So if I say UNC, how many of you think about the University of Northern Colorado? Uh, perhaps another university? Yeah. North Carolina. So I had to retrain my brain not to go UNC and then say, oh, the University of North Carolina, is that it? Yeah, so I, I really had to work on this. Uh, so UNC, which is in uh, Greeley, a smaller university, a small program that has emphasis on community health and is uh, the focus of some of our efforts in rural health, which the state legislature is now providing some initial funding to the medical school, a little bit coming to us, to work on rural health. So for those of you who know Colorado, we have the front range, you know, Colorado Springs up, which is most of the population, the big cities, but then there's the rest of the state, which is enormous. There's rural counties and frontier counties, some very sparsely populated with very diverse public health needs, some incredibly small health departments, that still have to provide all the core services. So there's lots of different uh, challenges in, I think our UNC program, the other UNC, uh, is uh, important for that. So that's what we have. Each has these freestanding MPH concentrations and the opportunity for the students to take across, uh, courses across. Uh, so that is, uh, that's there. So that's our collaborative model. Um, so you've seen that we have about 700 students now. Our, let me just go back. Our faculty model is different. So the Anschutz campus, sort of like a school of public health, five departments, traditional affiliations. Colorado State, we have a very small core faculty, six or seven, and then the rest are affiliates drawn from throughout the, um, throughout the university, about 70. And at uh, UNC, a small core faculty of about four or five. And again, we have to maintain a critical mass there. So just saw that, uh, the traditional uh, departments. I'll, I'll say a word about our centers because a lot of our core work goes on through the centers, whether it's research or practice. So if you look, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna talk about a few of them. So we have a Center for Public Health Practice that has statewide reach, has about 30 folks working in it, a lot of on-the-ground training, a lot of policy support, for example, around tobacco control. We are providing education under a new bill to the county health boards, to the members about what public health is. Uh, we have uh, programs in nutrition and other areas. We have the uh, Rocky Mountain Public Health Training Center that does a lot of work around um, food safety uh, issues. We have a center now for injury prevention and uh, research. Our Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health, this is their building uh, on the image. This is, I think, the sort of go-to place in the country for work on American Indian and Alaska Native Health. We have about 15 faculty members it's run by Spiro Manson, who's a, a phenomenon, Chippewa uh, uh, tribe. And uh, we, we have reached through many of the tribes in the United States and Alaska, centers related to mental health, diabetes, you know, you name the list, and we have the, those centers there. Um, just a few other examples, and again, this is sort of the structure. So some of the research falls in the center. The Life, Life Course Epidemiology of Adiposity and Diabetes, or LEAD Center, is a very large NIH-funded program that stitches together multiple cohorts to look at diabetes and obesity and the origins across the life course. So research sits there, another very large um, program. Our Center for Innovative Design and Analysis sits within biostatistics 
partially funded by the School of Medicine, it provides data sciences support across our campus. So again, there are probably 25 people in there, some at the doctoral level, some at the master's level, who are providing this data science and support, which is ever more and more um, needed. I shouldn't say this, but when I started at the University of New Mexico, the dean told me that you only needed one biostatistician in a medical school. And why was that? Why did you even need one? To teach biostatistics to the medical students. And that was the answer. And of course, the world has changed. And you know, data is, underlies everything. It will be critical to the new school of public health. So I'm going to point this up because structurally we're matrixed. And you will probably end up being matrixed too with research and practice activities, perhaps sitting in center. I think the centers, the good thing about the centers is they bridge departments, they bridge schools. The bad thing about the centers is they can become silos and sometimes, just a warning, create problems for deans. And I th think that's obvious, but uh, anyway, uh, you will find those. So, oops, uh, we can skip that. So just on the, on the degrees, the MPH, Master of Science degrees, I don't know what your intent is. Some schools have developed very large MS programs, um, in part because master students pay tuition. And um, my prior department, I was chair of epidemiology at Hopkins for 14 years. They have an enormous master of science program in epidemiology. It's, in terms of having a, a degree that would actually get one a job, it's pretty good. It's a good opportunity and potentially a gateway onto a PhD or working in a health department, pharma. I mean, there's so many opportunities for people who are epidemiology or data fluent now. So where you're going with that is something to think about. We have PhDs in a number of areas. I'll talk about a new one and the Doctor of Public Health degree. And then you can see the different things. I, I will say, and I'm just uh, not to go through, here's the different MPH opportunities. And we, we have a couple of fully online opportunities. We do have a new MPH in population, mental health, and well-being that is probably in about its third year that's been very successful because there aren't many programs that are akin to this one. Uh, uh, we have residency, preventive medicine, occupational medicine uh, residencies, and lots of uh, postdocs involved in our uh, research. And the dual degrees, again, an opportunity with this, with certainly with your circumstances. And you can see we have affiliations with uh, most of our sister, our companion schools. Our social work program is with the University of Denver, where we have a joint, uh, a joint degree opportunity. You know, we have connections to you know, the School of Architecture and Design and other places, all relevant to um, public, uh, public health. Our certificates, we have a bunch. And they have not done what I hoped they would do. They, they've had, I think, limited appeal for those who are out in state and local public health. They're not interested, those folks generally. They want the educational opportunities. They're not looking for an academic certificate that you know, comes with fulfilling sort of so many credit requirements and paying tuition. And we're looking for other ways to meet the, the needs. And I'm intending that we're going to develop a data sciences program that will have modules that can be taken and will probably can have very little, uh, little cost. Uh, and then the undergrad program, and again, I know of great interest here with UT uh, SA. We have a program at the Denver campus where we co-teach uh, classes. We have a four plus one there. We will soon have a four plus one at UNC, and we have launched four plus ones with six departments at Colorado State. And we hope that the, we will be able to funnel uh, more students into our programs, and it's through some of these institutions really enhance the diversity of our students. Research, you know, we are research driven. I think our research budget this year is 
somewhere around $36 million a year. So, and I'll show you some other schools just to give you a, a feel for where we, um, where we are. We've had a real surge. The uh, Colorado State has another roughly 10 or $11 million of research. We don't count, I mean, this goes back to things you have to work out. So we don't count all the money that goes through the cancer center. We don't count all the funding that may be in partnership with the School of Medicine. If there's a School of Medicine PI or the MPI is in the School of Medicine. So, you know, this, and this sort of counts because those who rank schools, for example, look at NIH budget. Um, so you can't count the funding twice or can't go to the School of Medicine and to the School of Public Health. So I mean, those are the kinds of details that just have to get uh, worked out. I want to emphasize public health practice, and I, I think that's a name that we use very broadly for all the activities we undertake that are not particularly knowledge generation per se, but knowledge translation, policy, policy advocacy that go on. And there's you know an awful lot of things that we uh, that we do. Uh, some of us through our practicum experience, our capstones where we're giving back through the activities of our um, Students, we train people, our Center for Public Health Practice. Our Center for Health, Work, and Environment has a program called Health Links that is for promoting healthier workplace. They're funded by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health to promote this concept of total worker health. They have been very busy during the pandemic uh, with their programs. So again, um, many things that go on, and I'll come back to this as a key part of our mission. Just a few examples. So uh, with the COVID, with the pandemic, you know, what did we do as a school of public health? Well, the first answer was we did something. And you, know, you can't have a pandemic and unfold in front of you. And then the first question was, what are we going to do? Well, the first thing I was worried about was we had spring break, and spring break was going to be over. And every class had to appear in a remote <coughs> setting, which was a uh, Challenge, but that same week we were worrying about um, classes and safety of everybody. We launched this COVID-19 modeling group that I put put together, at the, really after interacting with the state to health department about what we could do for them, and we put together a group that still meets, uh, that's now state funded. Uh, that has modeled the pandemic for Colorado and addressed Colorado-specific questions. So again, for those of you who have tracked COVID modeling, there are plenty of people doing it, sometimes with very different results, uh, sometimes very confusing. But since March 2020, we meet with the governor regularly. I mean, at times we were meeting with the governor twice a week and on a panic basis as, you know, our hospital counts approached our thresholds for overwhelming the healthcare system. You know, now, luckily, you know, we're down. I mean, this week we met with the governor. What did we talk about? Where are we going with bivalent boosters? Not so good. What is the impact going to be? What if whatever the next variant arrived and it looked like this, this, or this? Uh, what might we face? So, you know, we're in this lull, great. Maybe we'll stay with a lull. Maybe pandemic will become endemic. Maybe it won't. And you know, maybe we'll have, you know, there's always another one out there. There's BA.7, BA there's BQ1. I mean, the, you know, there's the whole alphabet soup continues, and this virus is going to keep mutating. But other things we did, we've set up uh, regional modelings. We've made access. I worked with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to implement a program of sessions for the public. And you know, in these days of Zoom, we could invite people from Washington, from Europe, from WHO, from anywhere. And to date, we did, initially, we did one every week for a while. It was taxing on the museum staff. They did a terrific job of producing, uh, producing these. So I did the first one. We had 800 people on from the public uh, as a session and continue. So we look for these uh, partnerships. Um, just an example of an emerging issue. So climate change and health kind of worry you? 
You're supposed to say yes, <laughs> in case you didn't know. Um, so uh, climate change and health. So I was just co-chair of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health Task Force on Climate Change and Health. Our report is out this week, and it has our thoughts about what schools of public health should be doing, required reading for new deans. And we're now, our school is very interested in climate change and health and our Environmental Occupational Health Department has seized on this. We have a PhD that we are launching that's moving its way up the approval process at the university in climate change and health, and something we feel is a strength. Colorado has great depth in climate sciences, atmospheric sciences through our universities and through the federal labs in Boulder. So we're building this area, and I, I think the main point is here is about being nimble at thinking about what are the emerging issues and how does the school figure um, into uh, those? Equity, diversity, inclusion, racism. It's I, you know, an issue of our times in ways that it hasn't been before when it should have been. And I'll just say that expectations are high. I think our students are really driving with their sense that the school we, big we, should be doing things and making changes. So, you know, some of the things that we have done, you know, trainings, which I think most places are doing, we've, we've done some things that I think have been helpful. We've had, uh, we started this uh, a year ago with everybody reading books together. So we read Cast, that probably many of you are familiar with, The Sum of Us, uh, which probably many of you know as well, this semester, we're reading uh, Louise Erdrich's The Night Watchman, which is fiction. And then Linda Villarosa's book, uh, we just had her as a guest, Under the Skin, uh, is for the spring. I, I think it's been useful because it's had us talking to each other. And, um, you know, people sit, our leadership team has read these books together and s talked about the issues and used words like racism, structural racism, that we're not usually saying to each other, talking about in these contexts. So I think it's been really important. We have a search advocate program of training people who will be on search committees to promote uh, uh, diversity. We're actually providing stipends to individuals who are willing to have the training and serve on search committees. And we're talking about how to do cluster hires that may enhance diversity. So I'm, and, I, and I know you'll be thinking about the same issues because we all are. To be a collaborative school or not, um, I, I will just leave that hanging. So there are strengths, and for sure. Do I have little administrative or big administrative nightmares because we're a collaborative school? Yes. Okay, and they relate to the administrative problems. We have a memorandum of agreement that describes funds, flows, and who does what, but um, there is extra administrative overhead involved in having not one school, but three schools. There are structural issues related to tuition flow that come up, like one school accuses another of siphoning off student revenues or other kinds of things. And that said, I like the diversity that we bring of the campuses. And each one has unique strengths. Um, and. Um, Constantly, you know, with leadership changes, needing to sort of say, yes, by the way, you're part of a collaborative school of public health, provost of whatever university, and then the next provost of that university, and so on. So you have to, have to deal with all that. So I think you're partially answering that question here. So I'm going to say a little bit about the state of public health, uh, of academic public health. And this goes back again. Do we need another school of public health? Uh, we can maybe collectively come to that answer or question. So as I began to look at this, there are a lot of schools of public health and programs in public health. So here's some figures. There are 150 CEF accredited programs in public health. So they are giving an accredited MPH. And you have a bunch here in Texas. Um, you know, every... Um, Every year, well, it's been every year lately, there's this voting on ranking of schools of public health by U.S. News and World Report. And I was amazed when I last 
looked at the programs, how many there were. In California, most of the Cal States, or many of them, have an MPH program uh, and other places. So there's a lot out there. Uh, there's 68 schools of public health at the moment, and I understand a bunch under development in uh, Texas. So you might notice there's a void in the middle of the country. Uh, when our school started, we were Arizona down in Tucson, of course, and then us in the Rocky Mountain, in Rock, Rocky Mountain region. So there's a gap in the map, and the usual East Coast, West Coast thing that always bothers me. And uh, so here we are. And the uh, baccalaureate programs, undergraduate public health, again, rising in uh, popularity. Uh, Texas, you've had this unique model with uh, the uh, University of Texas with Houston in the, in the lead in their program and the satellite campuses, um, a vision that goes back to the original dean there, Stoney Stallins, who's a very interesting uh, character. So here's your map and, uh, and then programs. And I understand beyond UT, uh, beyond San Antonio and its school, there are a number, number of other programs that are intending to become schools. And I guess a new school at uh, Southwestern uh, is coming along. So the landscape here is changing. Here's the growth over the last 10 years. The, the jump up there in programs is because programs only became part of the ASPPH, the Association of Schools and Programs in Public Health, in uh, 2013. So that's why that line uh, jumps up. Many of the programs are not in ASPPH because there's a cost that's fairly substantial. Uh, and then the schools of public health. I think when I went to the Harvard School of Public Health, deep in the 20th century, there were 12 or 15 schools of public health. So a lot of change. And then uh, master's degrees. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, master's and uh, doctoral degrees. <clears throat> so you can see where that total is, about 14,000 master's graduates uh, a year and uh, a lesser number, far lesser number of doctoral students. And a rise in applications and interest. Um, with the pandemic, there was a bump uh, in the 2021 admissions. We sort of come back down a little bit last year to lower than our peak. And we'll see where things go. We may have, through the pandemic, pulled a lot of people in and were sort of poised to go into public health and said, I'm going to go solve pandemics and uh, get involved in public health. So, you know, we'll see where this, um, where this goes. And, you know, again, in your marketplace, you know, obviously thinking about what the needs uh, are and more doctoral applicants too. So this is all good. Uh, and I think there's needs that we'll come to. So there's that bump from the pandemic. Okay, again, this is all coming from the uh, ASPPH. In terms of where NIH funding sits. So I know you will want to have a School of Public Health that is a research institution that's doing research um, about Texas, South Texas, San Antonio. And to give you a feel for sort of where the top 10 are in funding from NIH, uh, this is sort of the level. These are very large institutions, some, and some like Brown has some single very large center sorts of activities that pull them up, but you know, many schools are in sort of the 5 million, 10 million, 15, 20 million, and you, know, you have to start um, somewhere and figure out what you can do. Public health workforce, uh, is there a need? Uh, and the answer again is yes. So here's the demographics, and if you look up there at the top, 51 plus, 38 percent of the workforce. A lot of those thinking about retiring. Uh, the uh, public health has become predominantly a field with women. Public health students, ours are 75 to 80 percent women. Our faculty is becoming, again, quite, quite similar in its composition. There's diversity, but I, I will say in terms of academic public health, we lack diversity. This is the public health workforce more generally. And uh, my school, many of the schools, are simply 
not as diverse and certainly not reflecting the populations where they are uh, and something we are all working on. So this is sort of the bad news. So the pandemic has brought a lot of people in public health to think about leaving public health. And I think you know from the pub popular accounts the stresses and strains that everybody has experienced. And when I talk to my colleagues in the communities in Colorado, a lot of them are burned out, a lot of them have been buffeted, and a lot of the leaders of the county public health departments have moved on, or have been moved on, uh, which is something different. So there's a, there's a need, and even before the pandemic, the workforce was declining. It was declining because of funding, because of a lot of the pass-through monies that come through CDC to support state and local public health were diminishing. So we need to rebuild, and again, you can be part of that rebuilding. So here's, this is from the University of Michigan, some uh, projections on job openings coming uh, along, uh, and you know, seems like lots of spots to fill. This is uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, math and statisticians, anything data, lots of needs, and occupational health and safety, health education, and then here's um, environmental scientists and specialists and epidemiologists, with, again, with needs to come. Okay, and we have an aging public health workforce, a diminishing public health workforce, a bruised public health workforce, and it's going to need to be rebuilt, hopefully, with young, fresh faces like some of you in this room. Um, what does the School of Public Health do? If I, can I go over by an hour? Uh, so we educate and train, research, public health practice, and I'll say evidence-based advocacy. I mean, these are, I think, sort of the core things we do. So mission statements. And actually, I haven't looked at yours. Is it written? Designing one. You're designing one. Depending one. Okay. <laughs> so here's your start, the generic mission statement. The mission of the XX School of Public Health is to advance the health of YY and ZZ through education, research, and practice. We blank, blank, blank. So there you go. Uh, so here's some examples. So here's us. Okay. We promote, and I, I think this is important, we have a place-based mission. We have the state and the Rocky Mountain region, and we reach beyond. So here's what we want to do. We want to make people healthier, make our communities healthier, and here's how we're going to do it. So that's our statement, and it's simple, I think, as it should be. I, I pulled a few others. I mean, this was sort of an interesting uh, exercise. So here's some of your Texas colleagues. You're creating solutions for a healthier community by advancing knowledge. And so I, we can vote. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, better not. We're in Texas. Okay. Uh, Texas A&M, transforming health through interdisciplinary inquiry. You know, I, I've got to say, I'm not from Texas, so I can say, I don't like these. Because um, I, I don't think they, they, they don't get at really sort of what, what is being done for people, I think. So, I, but I've got a few other better ones, too. Here's uh, <laughs> UT Health, changing the culture of health through excellence. And, you know, it, so there's another one. Uh, this is Harvard. The overarching mission of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health is to advance the public health, public health through learning, discovery, and community. Actually, it's not bad, is it? Cribbit. Uh, and then Hopkins, improvement of health. Again, how are we going to do that? And again, I think this one captures what needs to be captured. This is Yale, which I thought was really strange. We catalyze health. Does, that, does catalyzing health mean you're making it better or worse? <laughs> I mean, it could go in either, either direction, couldn't it? So I don't know. Thumbs down for Yale. <laughs> um, so, you know, just um, maybe I, closing out, I think I'm near the uh, end, except I have some last things I need to leave you with. So this is an article that I wrote with colleagues um, and we published this two years ago. And I think this was probably one of the first of these 
post-pandemic public health articles. And I actually think it's pretty good what we said. And there's now lots of reports. There's going to be a wave of these. And I think your challenge is to vision where public health is going, what it's going to be. And as we discussed last night, the first graduates of your school, if it starts in 2024, are 2026. So let's say that they have a 40-year shelf life. They're going to be doing public health in 2066. That's a long way out, isn't it? And what are they going to be doing? What are the problems going to be? Well, you're going to have to prepare them for that. And so I think that's your challenge is to see where things are going. So I think this last was, oh, let me skip all this. You know this. Um, so I was going to describe for you your target, but you know it. Um, so some questions. So what is your target populations? And for recruiting students, for addressing needs, is your place-based mission here, San Antonio and Bear County, and South Texas? Is it all of Texas? Is it Colorado? Stay away. Um, is it, you know, whatever else. So, and who are your partners? And I know you're already building those partnerships that are going to be critical. What do your communities want and need? What's your brand going to be? And I think that's really, really um, going to be critical. So what are you doing that's special and unique? And both establishing yourself on the campus with state and local public health in the communities. And I, I, again, with what's coming in Texas with more and more schools, I find this landscape a little bit confusing. And so if you're going to want to stand out among the 11 schools or whatever it's going to be that you can apply to in Texas for an MPH, why do people want to come here? Well, one reason will be it's, you know, 10 miles away. But another may be that you are the place to go to learn how to work with the health of Latino communities, the Latinx communities, or something else. And I think you're going to have to build that in, and I know you know that. Um, and then, you know, there are all these other issues that come up, and I could make this list as long as anybody wants to hear about, but interactions on campus, interprofessional education, um, are you involved with other schools in teaching the public health aspects of curriculum? The data sciences issue, which I think is really critical to the future of research in our health sciences campuses, and uh, like UTSA, the folks concerned with the health discipline community-engaged research, mundane stuff like the flow of indirect costs. I, and I don't know, it always comes up, and you, know, you can't make it go away. Um, and then what are your indicators of success? What do you want to achieve, and what are the markers at five years, or at 10 years, or at 15 years? I was at Public Health in the Rockies last week, um, which is our state public health meeting, 600 people there. I would say 40% of them were alumni or students or faculty of our school. So it was great to see that impact being um, realized. So I think we got there. So, you know, and then what are you going to be doing this next 40 years things? When I look at my career, which has been going on, I'll give it 40 years, so many things have happened that I never would have thought of. Okay? HIV AIDS. About 1980, when I was well into my pulmonary career, we could treat most respiratory infections, maybe not viruses, but bacteria. Then suddenly HIV AIDS changed the landscape. Social media, who would have thought? We used to do public health campaigns with TV spots and billboards and pamphlets. Uh, kind of changed, hasn't it? So, uh, and the politics of public health, I can't, can't set that aside. So, I think I'm going to end with uh, uh, good luck, uh, and uh, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. <laughs>